Welcome to the eSchool of the European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. My name is Hildegard Bühning. I'm professor of infection biology of the gene transfer at Hannover Medical School and the current president of the ESGCT. The ESGCT is a nonprofit organization founded in 1992, and we promote fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, cell therapy, and vaccines. Education is part of our mission. Therefore, we launched the ESGCT eSchool in May this year. We are very pleased that highly recognized scientists and clinicians in the gene and cell therapy space, like our speaker today, are so supporting us by giving lectures. Last week, we started with part four of our series, which is dedicated to safety aspects. And today, in particular, we look at immune responses. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Anne Galli. She studied pharmacy and immunology at the University of Lyon. And after obtaining her PhD, she moved to the States, where she became associate professor of the School of Medicine and Barbara Ankamaus Cancer Institute in Detroit. She is now a director of research at the Instrum Unit 951 at Janitor in Henri. And uh, to um, who wants to know what is Geneton? Geneton is a non-for-profit institute dedicated to the treatment of rare diseases by cell and gene therapy. So Anne's research focus as an expert in immunology and gene therapy is uh, uh, on gene modification of immune and the blood system for therapeutic application. Her lecture today is entitled Immunogenicity, the challenge of our own security system. And we are very much looking forward to your talk, Anne. Thank you very much, Hildegard, for this invitation and kind introduction. Mm -hmm. So indeed, I will be presenting a general um, uh, discussion basically on immunogenicity, the challenge of our own security system in the context of uh, gene therapy. The immune system is a true balancing act. Uh, our body needs to uh, basically uh, control uh, the tolerance to our tissues, uh, but also uh, get involved into the tissue repair processes. And at the same time, also tolerate the microbiota that we live with and um, uh, enable these bacteria or this oral tolerance to take place for our metabolism to process. And uh, at the same time, we are, of course are uh, uh, facing uh, invasions by viruses and pathogens, which uh, we need to uh, control, but sometimes have evolved to also control our uh, immune system. So this, of course, is a real challenge uh, when we are talking about gene therapy. Gene therapy, which is a very broad uh, technology that is used for many different applications, uh, including to treat cancer. But I will be really focusing today on the use of gene therapy, and in particular, the use of viral vectors for gene therapy in the context of the treatment of genetic diseases. So in this case, what we want to do is we want to have a treatment that is basically going to be fully integrated into the body of the recipient and will provide a long lasting uh, therapeutic benefit. But for that, you have to deliver the uh, genetic payload. And so viral vectors are very often used for that as they are very efficient. But irrespective, irrespective of which type of vector is being used for gene therapy, it will always be the same uh, uh, mechanism that will take place. The vectors that will be injected in the body, and we're talking also primarily about systemic injections where the vectors basically encounter a large part of the body and immune system, it will uh, encounter all of the different branches of the immune system. It will first uh, be in contact with what we call the innate immune system. So innate immune system is made of, of cells which have no, very, no um, um, highly specific ways of recognizing differences in pathogens, but they re recognizes uh, basically pathogen uh, uh, receptors or pathogen uh, signatures. And these are phagocytic cells, uh, which can then um, sense and, 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 and endocytose or uptake the different uh, microbes or pathogens. There will be also the uh, soluble effectors of the innate immune system, such as the complement system or lectins, or all of these sort of non-specific ways that will in fact trigger a very rapid reaction and uh, will in fact also uh, yield uh, potentially inflammatory signals. 
the uh, capture of the pathogens by you know the different uh, cells of the innate system will also be accompanied by the uh, migration to the uh, lymphoid organs where it will in fact encounter the antigen presenting cells, in particular the professional antigen presenting cells that will in fact uptake and bring these pathogens and also process the antigens of the pathogens and present that to the T cells, either to CD4 or CD8 T cells, and also uh, activate uh, the T cell and B cell responses through the um, expression of coactivating and regulatory molecules, as well as checkpoint inhibitors to be able to, in fact, control the dynamic and the balance of this immune reaction, which must be at the same time effective, but not last too long and not, in fact, turn back into the body uh, to be, in fact, too detrimental. So this is a very delicate balance and it involves a lot of different cell types. And in fact, um, recent, um, this past, I would say 10 to 15 years in the progress that has been made into the immunotherapy of cancer and has really, I think, um, uh, improved our ability to understand very finely what are the different checkpoint inhibitors and the different molecules which are involved into controlling the immune system because tumor cells are, of course, very um, well adapted at trying to, in fact, pretend to be self so that they are not eliminated by the immune system. So this has, in fact, uh, given us a lot of complexity in our, our, our understanding between the interactions between tissue cells, which express antigens, antigen presenting cells, which can be more or less activated or energized, and T cells, which can be exhausted, activated, and the memory uh, um, uh, phenotypes, which then, in fact, allow a very rapid response if, if it uh, takes place. So there's many uh, effector molecules and many different mechanisms, and this has been also tremendously helped recently by single cell transcriptomic analysis, which have described various populations of cells, which are effector, memory, exhausted, and different transitional states. And now we have a very complex view of these immune responses, which are really helpful, and with numerous new activators, uh, which could be also therapeutic targets that of interest in the case of gene therapy. I'd like also to uh, introduce the notion of those innate signals. We have talked about innate signals, which can be triggered by the uh, vector itself or by the microbial signals. But you have to remember also that um, gene therapy in particular is not necessarily given to a uh, body that is in a, a steady state condition. We very often have to treat patients with diseases which can have also inflammation or uh, degenerative processes. And this, in fact, uh, uh, leads to the uh, production of dumps or damage associated molecular patterns, which can be released from dead or damaged cells and are recognized by toll like receptors on antigen presenting cells or phagocytes, and then can trigger this inflammatory context, which will for sure interfere with our ability to. Uh, administer the vector and uh, immune uh, control the immune responses associated to that. So this is a very important concept to always keep in mind, as this could be very different from one pathology to the other. A last point of importance, I think, is that you have to remember that immune responses are dynamic. They evolve, and they evolve according to a certain predictable schema in terms of first priming and antigenic presentation, priming of the naive cells, uh, clonal expansion, differentiation of these cells into you know, antibody secreting cells or effector T cells. And then there's a elimination or effector response, which leads to the humoral immunity that can evolve and also cell-mediated immunity. And then there is a phase of contraction for homeostatic purposes and also that leads to some exhaustion. And then we have the surviving memory cells, which can then uh, also migrate and establish themselves in the right areas of the lymphoid organ. So remember that, in fact, when you study an immune response, if you're, for instance, looking at Tregs at some point, this could be a very normal part of, of a dynamic and not necessarily a regulatory response. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So <clears throat> unwanted immune reactions in gene therapy are a real concern. We're talking about injecting those gene therapy vectors into patients. Um, and they have occurred in several circumstances in the past. So when very inflammatory vectors were used, we have had the occurrence of innate reactions by cytokine storm. 
as seen, for instance, with adenovirus uh, vectors. We have clearly seen immunization against transgene capsids uh, and transgene products. We've seen evidence of tissue destruction and loss of efficacy. So this is really something that is concerning the community as uh, this is limiting, of course, the uh, safety and efficacy of gene therapy. So clearly, um, there's a very easy uh, countermeasure to apply, which is to uh, administer immunosuppression at the same time as the vectors are given to patients. But this is easier said than done. Uh, immunosuppressive agents are uh, sometimes very toxic, and there is an issue with the risk benefit of giving an immunosuppression to patients and exposing them perhaps to uh, secondary effects um, um, due to this immunosuppression. And there are also sometimes some impact between immunosuppression and uh, the uh, physiopathology of the disease that we're trying to treat. So this is not such an easy uh, task, but hopefully there are some solutions um, that are um, coming up and which I will present uh, in part. Um, the European Medicines Agency, uh, he is concerned about the immunogenicity of the vector. This is clearly something that uh, uh, in the guidelines on the quality and non-clinical or clinical aspects of the gene therapy medicinal products, there is a specific section it's not very detailed, but there is a section on immunogenicity, and uh, the EMA recommends that for the development of the products that there should be some testing of pre-existing immunity to the product, immune responses to the transgene product or to the vector, and to document in the clinical trial the concurrent effects of immunogenotoxicity or immunogenicity, sorry, with the concurrent effects of safety and efficacy so that things are better understood. So this is really something that, that, that is starting to be uh, uh, firmly established as a major concern and, uh, and a major thing to do in gene therapy. And it was probably a little bit, um, uh, I think, uh, underestimated in the past. So I will focus on uh, recombinant adeno-associated vectors for gene therapy. Uh, there are several other types of vectors that can be used in vivo. We even have lentival vectors. We also have, uh, you know, starting to have preclinical projects with uh, CRISPR-Cas9. We also have gene-modified cells. But um, let's focus on the administration of AAV because AAV really is very broadly used as a vector that is administered in a systemic fashion in many different applications uh, in gene therapy. There's already several gene therapy products that have been approved for um, uh, to be on the market Glibera, who is no longer, in fact, uh, maintained, but uh, Luxtrona in an ophthalmology indication and Zolgen SMA for uh, spinal muscular atrophy. There's hundreds of active clinical studies, and they are essentially in rare diseases for hemophilia, for uh, ophthalmology diseases, uh, also for pompous disease, muscular dystrophy, uh, congenital myopathies, et cetera, et cetera. There are also uh, AAV trials, which are ongoing for frequent disorders, such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, or macular generation, degeneration. And AAV is used for gene transfer, but also for opsin delivery or opto optogenetics. And it's also used as a homologous uh, directed uh, repair template uh, delivery system for CRISPR gene editing and applications. And finally, it's not really gene therapy, but uh, AAVs are used as vaccines. Uh, there are, in fact, a, a couple of uh, vaccine uh, trials ongoing for uh, COVID-19 uh, at the moment that are based on the use of AV. So AV is a very small uh, viral vector. It's, um, in fact, a uh, AV is a dependovirus. It's a 26 nanometer in diameter, which presents the great advantage of allowing the diffusion in the body that is very broad and touches all the tissues. So it's a real big advantage. Um, it has a, uh, it's a DNA virus. It has a genome flanked by ITRs, and it's in fact present in single-stranded or self-complementary form as a viral genome, depending on the design of the cassette and or on the stage of, of this uh, virus life cycle. So it can be in fact um, engineered to be a gene transfer vector. And uh, in fact, uh, the uh, capsid also can be engineered uh, to uh, have various uh, capsid serotypes, which are either taken from natural uh, AV uh, serotypes or they can be engineered. These capsids, uh, which is on the, uh, of course, on the outside of, of, the, of the viral particle, really define the tropism of the particle. It binds to proteins. It also 
uh, binds to receptors on the cells and uh, it binds to attachment factors. And it's, uh, as we will, um, as we have seen, in fact, is very important for immune cell interactions. So there are immune response limitations in AAV gene therapy. There has been no evidence, as far as I know, of strong uh, cytokine storm-like innate reactions in MAD from the administration of AAV, and that's a real great advantage of this vector compared to adenoviruses, for instance. It is a non-inflammatory vector. But uh, there's other uh, problems. Um, the AAV capsid, in fact, is uh, confronted by the fact that there is uh, a lot of people who have pre-existing neutralizing antibodies against the AV capsids. So this is due to uh, prior infections and by AV. And so that makes a large population, depending on the serotype of ineligible persons that cannot receive gene therapy, at least in the current state of our knowledge, because they will in fact neutralize the vector that we will inject. There's also, uh, if you inject a recombinant adeno-associated virus vector, um, the capsid itself will induce antibodies and it will also induce T cell responses. And these T cell responses will be directed against the cells that in fact contain those capsids. They don't express them, but they contain them. And so we have toxicity, cellular toxicity, and we have destruction of tissues and we have loss of therapeutic efficacy documented. And also the problem is that these T cells and antibody responses have created memory. They have created the long lasting uh, antibody secreting cells, and they will prevent redosing. Uh, you will not be able to readminister the same serotype in patients who have mounted an immune response following the administration of a recombinant and no associated vector, with a few exceptions. Now, um, the, the, the vector itself has those components, the capsid um, and, of course, the viral genome, but um, it also, also encoding for a transgene, and that transgene becomes a protein at some point. And uh, this transgene product can be immunogenic in some people, depending on the natural state of tolerance of that person against the transgene. So remember that there are also some, some very important genetic components in, in that aspect. But there is evidence, certainly in preclinical models and in a few cases in clinical trials, that it is possible to induce antibodies and T cells against the transgene product. And so in this case, uh, you have the target, which are the gene modified cells, and they can be targeted by this immune response for loss of therapeutic efficacy. And this can create also inflammation and toxicity in the tissue that was tried to, to, to be corrected. So all of these uh, limitations I will describe a little bit in greater detail, but I also want you to, um, uh, to understand that this is very this is not an obligation every time. So it will all depend on the type of serotype. It will depend on the genetic makeup of the person, on the person's disease, and of course, on the route of administration of the vector, as well as on the dose. We have a very broad variation of doses, that of, of a range of doses of vectors, which can be injected in humans for therapeutic effects of AV. And uh, these range from very, very small doses in the brain or in the eye to very large doses by systemic administration when one is trying to correct, for instance, neuromuscular diseases, where we are at the stage where we think that we need doses up to 10 to the 14 viral genome per kilo, which is really a very, very high dose of particles and the viral components to give to somebody. So <clears throat> let me address some of the issues. Um, not all of them, we don't have time, but some of them, and see what are the mechanisms and what we can propose to resolve the problem. One of the first barrier, of course, is that pre-existing seropositivity to AV capsid because that makes people not eligible to gene therapy. So it's due to the fact that there's a natural exposure to AV early in life in some patients or in some persons, which you know, results in pre-existing neutralizing antibodies. So depending on the serotype, and AV2 is usually the most seroprevalent, and you have a gradation depending on the serotype, but we can have up to 70%, down to 20% of the population that can be uh, already seropositive and has neutralizing antibodies against AV. Uh, there is a passage of maternal neutralizing antibodies uh, that is found in newborns. So it does not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily a, a, a population that is completely protected. 
And uh, these neutralizing antibodies cross-react with a wide range of serotypes because they are conserved regions. So this is really a problem. They reduce the gene transfer efficacy. And it's been shown by several um, publications that in fact, very low titers, even one to five, can be sufficient to even block uh, and to or to impair transgene uh, expression. So this is very often an exclusion criteria in many trials, and that's why people are screened up front, and they are only treated if they have no or very low level of neutralizing antibodies, at least up to now. Um, we know that neutralizing antibodies can interfere with entry because they will block the cellular receptors for the entry of the virus. They will also have an effect potentially on the post-entry mechanisms in terms of endosomal trafficking on internalization. And they will also facilitate the effect of other cells such as macrophages and uh, prevent and, and do also antibody dependent uh, cellular cytotoxicity uh, and help complement binding and activation which can be very deleterious. Um, we don't really understand very well yet still what is the contribution of these natural infections to the type of immune responses that are being, um, uh, or the effect that it has in gene therapy. Uh, but it suffice to say that if you're looking at either seronegative or seropositive individuals and that you re-stimulate them with vector, you can see a very big difference into their ability to very rapidly, in fact, differentiate and produce uh, antibody secreting cells, for instance, that will produce those antibodies. And so it's, it's really a problem. So one way to circumvent these pre-existing capsids uh, neutralizing antibodies is, is to screen and select seronegative individuals. But as I previously said, this could seriously hamper your, your, um, your ability to recruit patients. So one option is to change the vectors. So you can change the serotype, go to for serotypes which have a lower prevalence, or you can try to engineer and modify the capsids by genetic engineering. So many groups are working on new variants. Uh, they are engineering the capsids uh, in the different uh, regions of the five-fold, three-fold, two-fold symmetry because they have identified, for instance, um, uh, AV uh, binding sites and they can uh, intelligently and um, in fact, uh, try to mutate those areas to try to come up with some selected variants which are they're not recognized by those antibodies. So there's been several publications where they've described those stealth capsids, which are in fact um, sort of insensitive or less sensitive to the effects of let's say a polyclonal population of immunoglobulin in man. You can also try to chemically modify the capsids uh, or to coat the particles with uh, certain types of uh, chemical residue to render them a little bit less visible by pre-existing antibodies. But this is always a little bit of a challenge uh, challenge in terms of combining also the or maintaining the quality and the affinity of the particle uh, and also maintaining uh, their uh, properties as uh, tools which you can produce uh, at large uh, in large amounts to do those clinical trials. So it's, it's, it's a really difficult exercise, but uh, some of these uh, less immunogenic capsids exist. So another way to circumvent the pre-existing um, uh, neutralizing antibodies against capsid is to try to see if you can immunosuppress people and hope that you can give them immunosuppression that will in fact reduce those uh, levels of antibody. But this is hard and um, immunosuppression um, requires B cell depletion because these are the cells that produce the antibodies. So if you don't eliminate the B cells, then they will always uh, in fact secrete, but antibodies are stable, B cells are in fact, and antibodies also uh, stay for a very long time in tissues. Um, B cells, of course, have a very long life cycle, especially if you have memory cells. So um, people have tried to uh, use rituximab, for instance, to eliminate B cells, but this was not sufficiently effective to uh, reproducibly lower the anti-AV titers as was published. You can add another immunosuppressive agent, such as cyclosporin A. So it works to some extent in non-human primates, but it does not really address the problem of those high titers. So another uh, way to do that is to try to remove the antibodies by plasmapheresis. So basically you hook patients to a machine that will in fact circulate their blood onto a, let's say a resin or a chromatography um, system where in fact they will absorb the um, 
uh, antibodies. So you have to uh, implement multiple cycles of plasmapheresis uh, to in fact come up to a reduction. Again, there is a, a pool of antibodies that in fact is intratissular and that is not circulating and that is really difficult to deplete. So it has worked to some extent in humans at relatively low neutralizing antibody titers, but it's not very effective. It has been tried also in non-human primates. So it works a little bit and it could still be used in fact in case of a really urgent need, but it is not, I think, a technique that can be uh, imagined uh, or used for very large cohorts of patients and in a very systematic way. And it's also uh, pretty expensive. Um, and it adds basically a very long um, um, clinical manipulation of patient prior to gene therapy. A uh, third option which was proposed um, uh, by uh, Federico Migozzi some time ago was <clears throat> to use capsid decoid. So basically take capsids that will in fact uh, sort of saturate the binding sites of the neutralizing antibodies to try to dumpen and, uh, and, and eliminate in fact, um, tighter them out basically those antibodies in vivo. So um, it, it has, you know, the, 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 the article showed and suggested some evidence of, of efficacy, but in fact, one of the concerns that uh, can be um, raised with this approach is that in fact, this will uh, correspond to overcharging patients with capsid antigen. And uh, will this in fact, perhaps lead to T-cell immunization against the capsid? And so um, this is something that I think is interesting to discuss because Capsid-specific CD8 T cells uh, occur following administration, and in fact, uh, they were identified in uh, some time ago um, uh, in the context of the uh, hemophilia trial. And uh, there has been evidence that cytotoxic T cells against the capsid were induced following systemic delivery of certain AVs. So it causes liver toxicity, as evidenced by the induction of transaminase, as you can see, for instance, in the uh, um, uh, publication in 2014 by Amit Natwani, uh, there is a drop of factor IX activity as the transaminase is uh, raised. And at the same time, it was in fact demonstrated that there were some uh, capsid specific T cells. So this is a dose dependent effect. Uh, the uh, um, induction of this capsid specific T cell is not very uh, often seen at uh, mid or low dose, and it can be controlled by corticoids, but it is still problematic. So uh, to really think of, uh, you know, what if we put more capsid, is this going to be a good thing? Um, one of the question is uh, to think about antigenic presentation. So there are several types of antigen presenting cells. You have uh, the, uh, uh, for instance, the professional uh, dendritic cells, the uh, uh, myeloid dendritic cells, you have plasmacytoid dendritic cells, which are more geared towards innate and, and type 1 interfering immune response. You have monocyte macrophages, which are more phagocytic, and you also have B cells. So these are, in fact, all cells which can, in principle, interact and present AV. But is that the case? So uh, in theory, AV uh, comes into cells uh, through receptor binding attachment receptor and it's endocytosed. And then with the help of perhaps some uh, signal two or toll like receptor signal, in fact, the, um, uh, the particle can escape the endosome, but uh, either it uh, goes into the cytoplasm and then goes through a proteosome degra degradation. And then the peptides of the capsin can be then loaded by tap onto the MHC class one molecules in the ER, and then they migrate to the surface. And the cell can then present peptides of the capsid to CD8 positive T cells, which are specific for the capsid. So this can happen in any kind of cell. All of the cells, uh, professional APCs or not, will in fact have the capacity to load MHC class one as they express this molecule. On the other hand, you know, the endosome can also uh, continue to degrade the, um, the uh, capsids, and uh, this capsid then can be loaded onto MHC class II molecules. And this happens only in professional antigen presenting cells, where in fact the molecules can migrate with the invariant peptide into the uh, uh, endosome, and then the um, so complex uh, uh, regulation and fine tuning of the loading of these peptides onto the class two, but it results into the expression of a peptide presented to CD40 cell as loaded on the MHC class two molecule. So this in fact allows uh, a professional antigen presenting cells to present both class one and class two peptides and to activate 
54 CD8 T cells. So this could be this case of B cells, which also produce antibodies and then will off, get activated and produce neutralizing antibodies against the capsid. But we wondered whether this was the case, uh, for instance, in mice, and with which cells those um, AV particles can interact with. So what we did is we took uh, uh, AV particles and we, in fact, uh, um, uh, put some fluorescent molecule on them so we could detect them in vivo. And then we inject them and injected them to mice and then measured very rapidly after uh, a few hours which cells, in fact, are capable of interacting with AV. And as you can see, in fact, uh, some of the, uh, we, we've also compared this with the injection of nanospheres with the same size, roughly the same, you know, postulated charge and that we use as a control. And you can see that in fact, AVs can interact very, very well with dendritic cells and monocyte macrophages in vivo, not at all with B cells. We've always had very high difficulties in demonstrating interaction in this manner between AV and B cells. And uh, in the case of spleen, we can show that, you know, we have several populations of APCs that interact with the AV. So uh, clearly, uh, you know, many cells, except for B cells, can recognize AV. But does that make them present AV? Because those different pathways, which I described, are not equally active in all of the cells, which can use one pathway or the other, depending on their ability to degrade, to proteolytically, proteolytically degrade, or to engage in the endosomal uh, or vacuolar presentation. So what we did is, in fact, we took an AV and we put a peptide on it, a peptide that is, in fact, presented to a CD40 cells, the MHC class two peptide. So what we do is when we inject this AV with this DBY peptide, uh, we put that in vivo and it will encounter an APC, which one we don't know, but that APC will then interact with the CD40 cell specific for the peptide. So in, we had the chance of having this DBY peptide, which is a peptide from the male murine antigen, and we have T cells, uh, transgenic T cells with a TCR that is specific for the DBY peptide. These are called Marilyn uh, mice, and they have those um, CD4 T cells, which are TCR transgenic against DBY. So if you inject the vector, let it find its APC, let the APC process and present uh, the, uh, the peptide, then you inject after that the Marilyn cells and you see when they will divide. Uh, if they divide, it means that they have encountered somebody who has presented to them. So then we can inject different populations of cells and we can see which ones have triggered the division of the Marilyn cells. And as you can see, uh, we have uh, been able to demonstrate that uh, only the CD11C positive dendritic cells can present effectively the capsid to uh, T C40 cells, but not the macrophages, which are probably, in fact, uh, digesting and, in fact, uh, not really able to, uh, uh, to, to generate the right peptides and to correctly load them up on MHC class 2. And the B cells also don't, uh, don't uh, present uh, the uh, AV capsid, at least in the mouse system that we looked at. So uh, the other thing that we found is that this activation and this antigen presentation to CD40 cell is tremendously activated by the uh, presence of a, uh, an innate immune signal that is mediated by MYD88, which is an integrator of many toll-like receptor signaling pathways. And in fact, um, as you can see below, uh, in the mouse that is uh, depleted genetically of MYD88, there is a much reduced uh, uh, activation of the CD4 cells following this presentation. So th this, this, this in fact tells you a little bit the complexity of the interactions between AV and the different antigen presenting cells uh, in the immune system. So in fact, a uh, recent publication by Pei et al. and uh, with Samulski as a co-author has also looked at that question is, are empty capsids of AAV antigenically presented? And yes, they are, they confirm this and that um, they showed that there is a dose dependent uh, increase in antigenic presentation. They use a very similar system to ours. They are using the OVA. And in this case, they are looking at uh, a class uh, one presentation with the OT1 cells. But they showed that when they increase the dose of the uh, empty particles, uh, they can increase antigenic presentation and activation of the OT1 cells. So, um, um, we have confirmed this as well. We have made uh, AVs, in this case, AV1, either 
as empty particle or full particle. And I should perhaps indicate that when we're talking about empty and full, it means that empty is just basically, we're just making the capsid. We're just transfecting the producer cells to just you know, produce the capsid, but there's nothing inside. When you make a full AV, you have the capsid and inside you have the viral genome. So if you run these two preparations side by side on the Western blood, you see that you have the same amount of different capsid proteins on each of these particles. It doesn't change that. And when you inject them and you immunize, then you can see that using our system with DBY uh, that I described earlier, we have this amplification of these uh, Marilyn T cells in the same way, whether the particles are full or empty, which means that in fact, the empty capsid can very well be uptaken, presented uh, to T4, CD4 cells. However, there is a big difference between empty and full particles is that, in fact, the empty particles do not induce any antibodies against the capsid. So this was found with AV1, and we reproduced the same finding with AV8 on the E panel. You can see that the full particles are very uh, immunogenic. They generate antibodies that can be easily titrated in the serum of the mice, whereas the same amount of uh, particle as measured by capsid content is not able to give you any, um, any antibody. So the, those mechanisms of immunogenicity of AV capsids are complex. Uh, they, clearly the capsid is immunogenic. It is presented, but in fact, it can generate a T cell, a T -cell activation, but it, does, it, it requires a second signal uh, or a different signal, in fact, to also go all the way to induce B cell activation. So it's complex, uh, but it's interesting to try to understand that to be able to, in fact, control this. But to get back to the question that we asked initially, um, it's clear that if you're going to be using extra empty capsid, you really take the risk of adding much more antigenic material that you will be presenting to T cells. So it's not necessarily a good idea. But at the same time, this is clearly something that's not going to uh, aggravate your, probably not aggravate your ability to induce antibody response. So all in all, um, it's still debated, but I think that there is enough evidence here to say that this is probably not a good idea. And also it probably also, um, uh, I think, and uh, is a good, um, um, so it, it, I think it's important to check and to verify that when you're using preparations of AV, you don't have too many of these empty particles which have no therapeutic effect, and that could be potentially a problem on the uh, basis of the immune response. So those antibodies that are present and are produced by B cells, again, uh, are, are problematic. One, because they are in fact potentially neutralizing. They are not always neutralizing, but they can be. They also uh, can uh, help opsonize and phagocytose the cells, which are, you know, um, uh, you know, or the, or the virus itself. They can lead to antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity or to complement activation. So, can we get rid of these antibodies? This would, you know, this would be very nice. And it's complicated, as I said, but there are some solutions. And some, uh, uh, my colleagues at uh, Geneton, Federico Mingozzi and his group, Christian Lebon, Giuseppe uh, Ronziti, have recently published in Nature Immunology a very uh, interesting technique, which is using, in fact, a protease. It's an IgG degrading enzyme derived from Streptococcus pyogenes, called IDES. It's an endopeptidase that, in fact, is able to cleave immunoglobulins in specific area and just to generate the fab fragment. And so, you know, it's used in fact in transplantation uh, um, circumstances to try to reduce. So it's already been given to man um, and it's uh, looked into this context of transplantation. So they had the idea of trying to use that and to see if it could in fact be used to reduce the pre-existing uh, capsin antibodies. So in mice, when they in fact uh, take mice and they uh, inject those mice with IVIG, which is a polyclonal soup of immunoglobulins produced by uh, humans. What you do is you're basically blocking uh, the uh, transgene um, uh, expression or the, in fact, the, the, the vector, as you can see in the, in the black curve. Uh, if you had injected only PBS, of course, you would have the, the, the blue line and you would have a very nice transgene expression, for instance. And when you have uh, administered the IVIG, but in the presence of IDES, then you see that you can restore uh, in the mice a uh, very nice transient expression. And they've shown that, in fact, this is, of course, accompanied by the degradation of the immunoglobulin. Uh, 
So the nice thing is that they can even do this in non-human primates. They had two uh, non-human primates in which they had pre-existing antibodies, and they showed that by administration of IDES in the uh, animals, they can reduce the neutralizing antibodies and then also uh, augment the uh, gene transfer. And they've also uh, uh, established a protocol by which they can inject the vector into the non-human primates, generate the antibodies, then treat them uh, 200 days later with IDES, and then come back with a second dose of the vector, which normally uh, you're not able to do and still get a transgene expression. So this is a very interesting approach, uh, which needs to be, of, of course, further developed and studied in terms of its um, you know, safety, uh, whether or not it's going to be fully effective in all circumstances, all pathologies, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a really a very encouraging approach uh, and, and then to try a really uh, problematic uh, uh, circumstance, which is you know, the existence of this barrier. So, um, Besides having pre-existing antibodies, if you re-inject, if you treat someone with a AV vector, you're going to be in inducing antibodies to that vector, and so those antibodies will prevent redosing. So um, um, this has been seen in all models, in mice, in large animals, and in human gene therapy, and it prevents re-administration of the same serotype, except in some cases, in particular in subretinal injections, but it's a, it's a very specific case. So we. Of course, um, in theory, gene therapy can be given in one single shot injection and, and with a you know, lifelong treatment. That's the hope. But in reality, we know that we are dealing now with the treatment of children, children uh, that are being treated with a vector that is non-integrative, that is episomal. So uh, it is expected that over time there will be a dilution of the vector or of the therapeutic effect with the growth of the uh, patient. And so it is, you know, uh, something that to be uh, expected is that there might be circumstances by which you will have to retreat uh, people who have been treated as children to reinforce the effect of gene therapy. You also have the uh, problem of certain therapeutic doses, which are not sufficient uh, because there is some toxicity associated with it. So you need to give it several times, perhaps. So this is really something that needs to be done. We need to be able to re-inject potentially the vectors to try to increase the therapeutic efficacy. So in this case, you have a, you know, a simple solution, which is to immunosuppress the patient at the time of the injection of gene therapy. So clearly this is doable. You can do T-cell immunosuppression in mice. It's been shown a long time ago. You can use CTLA4IG, anti-CD4T, for instance, and completely eradicate or completely prevent the induction of antibodies or T-cell responses uh, to, to the transgene. You can use uh, cyclosporin A, non-depleting anti-CD4 antibodies. There are several solutions. One of the problem, however, is that all of these solutions, first, they, they, they have to be pretty strong to really prevent the induction of anything. And of course, in this context, you have a question of risk benefit ratio to evaluate. Um, some of the genetic diseases which are treated by gene therapy are sufficiently severe that you would be able to take that risk. Um, but uh, some of them are not that uh, severe and clearly it's going to be problematic to administer such strong immunosuppression to patient. And also it is not clear when this immunosuppression should have to be stopped. In some cases, you can continue to monitor the immune response. Sometimes you cannot. So it's, 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 it's really a problem. So we have been looking at uh, things which are potentially very well tolerated and would be very specific for really blocking the initiation of this immune response while not having some um, long lasting effect or um, peripheral effects, uh, collateral effects basically on the immune system. So again, uh, the group of Federico Mingozzi had tried, has worked with uh, nanoparticles uh, coated with, uh, which are biodegradable, uh, PLGA uh, rapamycin nanoparticle called SVP rapa, uh, which uh, in fact are also tested uh, in uh, uh, inflammatory uh, indications. And they have administered those uh, nanoparticles at the same time as they uh, injected the uh, gene therapy vectors. And they have shown, in fact, uh, both in mice and non-human primates that can really block the induction of antibodies to the AV8 capsid and the capsid T cell responses. They can redose with the vector and uh, they can also demonstrate an enhanced transduction in the liver. And uh, this effect seems to be 
partially controlled by the induction of TREGs, which seem to keep all of this in check. So this is a very interesting uh, approach, uh, which needs again to be further developed in different indication uh, to see how it can be used uh, um, in gene therapy. Of, of course, an alternative is also to try to use corticoids at the same time as the gene therapy vectors are given or when there are signs of immune response. Uh, this is a practical uh, way, uh, perhaps not entirely efficient. So there is really a need to find some very effective uh, and very precise way to control this immune response. We have found also in my lab uh, some uh, interesting observation where uh, we were working with MNTBAP, which is a superoxide dismutase. It's a, um, uh, an antioxidant, basically, uh, sod mimetic. And we found, uh, in fact, uh, rather serendipitously that this molecule can reduce or, comp or in fact, internalize uh, the CD4 uh, protein, which is at the surface of the uh, T cell membrane. And in fact, the effect is uh, rather rapid, uh, but it's temporary and the CD4 comes back after uh, the cells um, have been treated. And so we try to use this to see if we could have an effect in gene therapy by in fact, uh, in that very short window of time where the vector comes into the body and is presented to the APCs and to the T cells in that priming area, can we in fact perturb that so that in fact, there's no priming of immune response against the vector. And in fact, it works. So at least in mice, we can treat them in vivo with MNTBAP by uh, IP injections. And then we can inject the vector uh, and we continue the treatment a little bit to maintain uh, this uh, CD4 down regulation. And we show that in fact, we reduce the antibody uh, production and we can also, uh, in fact, come back uh, after that with a second uh, round of injection of vector. We can, in fact, uh, redose uh, without having uh, the blockage uh, uh, by the antibody. So it, it's something that's clearly not uh, at the stage where it's easily druggable, but it's a concept and it's a very important concept that you have, in fact, a, a pretty uh, small window of time and some pretty specific events that need to take place to have a productive priming. And so that in fact indicates that there's a lot of things to still do uh, in terms of having therapeutic targets to really resolve that problem of inducing immune responses by the AV vector. So this is something I think that, that is very promising and, 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 and will in fact be in, in, incremented into a lot of clinical trials, hopefully in the future. Um, I think I still have time for discussing uh, the um, question of the anti-transgene immunity, which is a very different question than the anti-capsid or anti-vector immunity. Uh, indeed, uh, we are here on a different concept because here the vector is going to go into cells that will be transduced and will express the transgene in a permanent way. So they will become, in fact, the target of any kind of immune response. And uh, this, in fact, concerns the antigen present in cells as well as the tissues which are being triggered you know, for correction. But if we're looking at the induction of the adaptive anti-transgene immunity, uh, in fact, there is uh, clearly both uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, infection of the antigen presenting cells by uh, the, uh, the uh, vector, and we have uh, presentation of uh, the uh, peptides of uh, the transgene product, which are then produced in the cells on MHC class one or MHC class two. And these are helped by the uh, presence of, of uh, vector components or also uh, nucleic acids, CPG, and, and signals which can in fact augment the uh, cross presentation, the uptake, and also augment the loading of the molecules uh, for class one and class two. So this will activate all of the uh, complete arms, CD8, CD4 response, and will generate also um, um, a complete immune response with innate signals. And um, these anti-transgene uh, T cell immune responses have been essential, they have been seen very easily in all the preclinical models in mice. It's very easy to generate them because very often people are using mice which are genetically null for the transgene that you're looking at. So 
they are naive and they will react against the transgene, but this is not always the case in human. But uh, some clinical trials have clearly demonstrated that in fact it is possible and it happens. There's no real tolerance that in fact is, uh, is, is happening in man when you put a transgene. And this is shown for instance in the MPS3B trial uh, that was uh, published a couple of years ago where they have injected in the uh, parenchyma of the brain uh, the uh, vector, even in the presence of immunosuppression, with oral tacrolimus and uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, and prednisone. And they have used people who are capsid seronegative, but they have uh, found evidence that, in fact, they had induced uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells specific for the transgene in the periphery of the patient. So uh, this is really a problem, and this is a brain disease. Uh, and so uh, it's also not very easy to know exactly where the priming occurred and where the uh, T cells are, if they are in fact acting on the, uh, on the brain tissue or not. Uh, but this is clearly, uh, there is evidence that you have a, a transient specific T cell reactivity in this patient following gene therapy. So again, if we go back to the models that we had, for instance, in the mice, where I was uh, showing you that we inject the AV with uh, uh, for instance, uh, a, a marker peptide. In this case, what we do is we take a transgene where we put the marker peptide and we try to follow the antigenic presentation of the transgene through this little peptide. And you can see that in fact, again, not all APCs are equally going to be presenting the transgene. And in this case, contrary to the capsid, which is really preferentially presented by the dendritic cells here, we have presentation of the transgene product both by macrophages and by dendritic cells in that model in mice. So by B cells, again, we could not find evidence that they were presenting the transgene. So in this case, what you can do is that you have a cell that is expressing the transgene product and it can activate T cells. Well, one solution is in fact to prevent transgene expression in those antigen presenting cells. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we tried was in fact to uh, use the microRNA uh, 142.3p target. So this is a microRNA that is expressed in cells of hematopoietic origin. And so if you have a target for this microRNA in your transgene, then in fact, the cells of hematopoietic origin will eliminate that transgene. So uh, we showed clearly that with this mere 142.3p target sequences, we can really reduce expression of the transgene in both the myeloid or the macrophage APCs. And in this case, completely allow the transgene expression and avoid the immune response uh, with this system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this did not work in a pathological model. When we have a dystrophic muscle tissue, we had no control whatsoever of antigenic presentation by this system. And it's a little bit complicated here to explain, but what we've done is we've followed the activation of um, the uh, an antigenic presentation through uh, the division of reporter cells. And you can see, in fact, that the microRNA target sequence can very easily control antigenic presentation in normal mice, but not at all in the sarcoglycan uh, knockout mice, which are very inflammatory. And so what happens in this uh, system, uh, and also we found that in this context, the role of CD4 cells was very important, uh, much more than the CD8 cells. If you can deplete CD8 cells, in fact, it really does not impact very much on your ability to express the transgene. But if you deplete CD4 cells, you will express your level of transgene. So this is also a concept that needs to change a little bit. People are really focused on CD8 cells as effector cells, but it's a CD4 cell that really orchestrate the entire quality of the immune response, both by producing cytokine, by activating everybody, and by activating B cells, and they're really key. So what's happening in this case is that when you have AV that's coming into a tissue like muscle, you have transduction of the tissue, you have expression of the transgene, but at the same time, if that tissue is being damaged, you have a release of the protein uh, transgene, and that is really being picked up in a secondary fashion by those phagocytes and APCs, which then will process a protein and not a transgene, and they will in fact be completely uncontrolled at the level of transcriptum uh, or tr transcriptional um, uh, expression, uh, expression of the uh, of, of the transcript. So um, here you have you know these two systems which make it very difficult to control through uh, expression uh, when you have a pathological uh, tissue. So um, 
to conclude, uh, we have gene therapy, a vector, recombinant and no associated vectors, which are very well tolerated, but they induce complex immune responses, which can potentially alter safety and efficacy of the procedure, and they still remain a problem up to this day, because we don't really have very systematically efficient tools to control this immune response, and we don't really always understand how it works. I have presented a lot of data in mice. We know that these data, mice are not um, entirely uh, uh, phenocopies, of course, of what's going on in humans, especially for immune response. So there needs to be a lot of things that are looked at also in humans and in clinical trials. I have shown you, however, that there are very promising advances in the control of these immune limitations. There are new vectors, new adjunct treatments, which really offer a lot of hope in trying to uh, uh, permit uh, the administration of gene therapy. I think that the patient inflammatory status is something that's overlooked and should be really addressed a little bit more systematically. And uh, there's also probably needs to be a little bit of uh, uh, improvement in our ability to immunomonitor patients in their follow-up to really know what's going on in the gene therapy. Um, lastly, a lot of people are engaged into engineering capsids and doing all kinds of AV variants, and uh, not all of them are considering immune reactivity. I think this is a little bit of a, of a problem. I think this should be almost kind of the major thing to think about when you're making different capsids. And finally, last point is that we've discussed practically only about AV, but the immunogenicity of all of the gene therapy vectors administered in vivo is a concern, whether it's a uh, anything like a lentiviral vector or even CRISPR-Cas9, if these have microbial psych sequences, they will in fact be uh, recognized by the uh, body. And so it will, you know, it's something clearly to study very uh, aggressively. Mm -hmm. So with uh, this, I would just have one last slide that is in fact, uh, uh, again, to present a little bit what's been done at Geneton by Philippe Béron on the platform that was initially started by Federico Mingozzi to try to really monitor very carefully uh, in patients, what's going on in terms of the antibody prevalence, their ability to re-administer, look at T cell and also other cell type responses. I think it's a very important aspect and still uh, that needs to, to evolve. I will finish by thanking my colleagues at Geneton, Timian, Florence, Maxime, Sylvie, Sylvain, Isabelle, Jérôme, Federico, Giuseppe, Philippe, who have contributed to some of the data that I've presented. Uh, our sponsors and um, who are supporting these studies, in particular, that's been engaged for many, many years in supporting this uh, research. And I would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, ready to take your questions. Thanks, Anne, for this wonderful talk and this uh, deep insight into the immune system and the interaction between, in particular, AV and the immune system. Um, while the people are uh, um, typing in their questions into the chat, um, let me start by uh, one thing which you um, mentioned in your uh, summary. You said that a lot of studies are done in the mice, but the immune system of, of mice are different from the human. So with regard to preclinical assessment, can you guide us what would be maybe more appropriate models? I know that's not a, a very, um, that it is a difficult question, but maybe give me your insight. It's a really difficult question because uh, it, it, we have a lot of evidence that AV interacts with different types of proteins depending on the species. So there's, you know, proteomic studies, for instance, that have identified different partners um, in mice, in dogs or, or in humans. So. Uh, you know, automatically that tells you that the models are going to give you some very uh, um, tissue, you know, species specific response. We also know, you know, from the work of others that the uh, um, tropism of the uh, capsid serotype in different tissues will vary between mice and human, for instance, in the liver. So really it's going to be a little bit of a guess. But unfortunately, and, and of course, sorry, there are known differences between the human immune system and the mouse immune system, for instance, in certain types of APCs or in certain types of, of um, toll like receptor ligand expression. Well, that said, um, unfortunately, we don't have much choice because um, it's really difficult to go, in vitro is even, I think, much more um, um, 
in vitro, for instance, AV will bind to anything. And you know clearly that in vivo, it's not the case. So I think that the in vitro models to predict immunogenicity are really, really problematic. I think that in vivo, at least you have uh, you know, the considerations of dose, tropism, and you know, these complex interactions, which may not be perfect and may not be absolutely just, but at least they give you, I think, a broader idea. Um, the, probably the best model is to go to non-human primates, but this is economically uh, really difficult. And uh, uh, the idea here would be to really try to um, sort of sort through all the main questions in the mice and then finalize with just a few hypotheses that you will test in a few non-human primate models. Alternatively, uh, it would be probably really, really useful to learn much more from the ongoing clinical trials. I personally find that the immune monitoring in the ongoing trials is very often very uh, limited. And it is difficult, I admit, but still I think that efforts should be made to really sample the patients as much as possible. And now that we have also all these miniaturized uh, tests, like single cell transcriptomic analysis, perhaps this is really something to be done uh, systematically to look at what's going on in patients. And then finally, the hope would be to have some more humanized uh, murine models, um, and we're working on that, but uh, we're not there yet in terms of really being sure that these are really representative of what's going on in humans. But this is a whole line of work that I think is very important. Thanks. And I mean, in addition to what you say with regard to the immune system, also, um, when you look into the animal models, you also see that um, the um, application routes, the barriers which the vectors are, are facing is a little bit different also in, in the animals with, reg uh, with regard to the human situation later on. So you are really making a very important point here that we really need to have a good system for really test the, the, the strategies. We have one question from uh, Chiara Simoni. And uh, the, she, first of all, la uh, thanks you for your talk and for the interesting talk. And then she asked, do you think that innate immunity responses to AV could be implicated in the recent death occurred in the X-linked multibular myopathy clinical trial? I have no, uh, not sufficient information in this patient to, to comment on that. Uh, it, the innate immune responses are usually very rapid and very uh, immediate, so I don't think this was the case. Um, the other thing that needs to be considered, and I, you know, I really again cannot comment on this case, which I don't know, but I think that you have to all bear in mind that these are already very sick individuals. Um, we have seen those, you know, adverse event, events in other types of gene therapy trials, and so uh, it's very important to try to understand exactly what was going on. And sometimes you realize that the physiopathology is not necessarily well known and that perhaps there are some underlying uh, consequences of the disease which were not necessarily corrected that could take place. So, but obviously you still have to take into account that there could have been some, some tissue toxicity and uh, you know, that uh, I'm sure is being explored, but I have no comment on that. Thanks. We have one comment from da uh, David De La Puente. He, sa he sa says he has no question, but he really says that it was a very nice and interesting talk and is thanking you. Thank you. And, and I have another question. So you were showing us um, some strategies for applying immunosuppression. And um, when you, at the beginning, you showed us the balance um, of the immune system, uh, which really somehow needs to, to be maintained. And the question is, when it comes to immune suppression, what about T-Rex? Uh, it's an obvious target uh, and it's, uh, several people, including ourselves, have tried to induce uh, T-Rex against the capsid. Somehow it's difficult. Uh, it works sometimes, at least in our hands. We have never published that, but you know, it, it was not reproducible. But in theory, yes, it would be very important to have strategy where you induce uh, uh, T-Rex to maintain that check. One of the questions, I mean, besides the, um, the beauty of the exercise on the immunological level, I think that on the clinical level, you may be worried a little bit of uh, inducing a long lasting tolerance against a um, 
you know, a viral component. We don't really know what's going to be the consequences of having a, a tolerance against AV. You know, does that make you more susceptible to other AV infections later? I don't know. But uh, yes, it, this is really clearly something that could be very interesting is to play on the uh, ratio of effector versus Treg. This is what we were finding, in fact, is that, you know, I showed you this sort of cinetic curve and you have a balance of Treg effector, which varies uh, around, you know, in time. And if you can maintain, in fact, that balance, you know, uh, not necessarily just, you know, have the Treg very high, but just change the ratio of Treg effector, you can have an effect. But again, this is not an easy strategy. Thanks. We have um, Mr. and Mrs. Benguerba saying thank you so much, Dr. Gali, for this great presentation. Could you elaborate on principles and guidance on the use of corticosteroids to control immune modulation of AV on liver enzymes? The use of corticosteroids. Corticosteroids. Uh, corticosteroids. Uh, yes, I think that uh, they were. You know, the the use of steroids uh, around the time of. Uh, uh, the occurrence of the uh, transaminase peak um, is being implemented in practically all the trials that we know of, that I know of. Uh, it seems to be sufficient to actually quell this uh, this uh, this response. I think the question is whether or not you could use that systematically before uh, or even you know prior to the administration of the vector to really prevent the priming. Um, but this is clearly a very easy thing to do and it's uh, it has some toxicity but it's not that toxic to the patients okay so thanks um i see no more questions and therefore i really would like to thank you again for this great talk and i would also like to um to announce that next week we have a, uh, the talk of claire booth who will look into genotoxicity, what we have learned from XKIT1 and about next generation tools for PID. Thanks again and bye-bye. Thanks.